Good morning, Rag Church. How y'all doing? My name is Ruslan. I'm a hip-hop artist, a spoken word artist, but I want to share a little story with you guys. Um, do you guys want to know what I want to be when I grow up? I said, do you guys want to know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a optimal, uh, optimal, optimal, uh, an eye doctor. But I'm kind of lazy, right? See, every day I wake around 8 to 8.30, depending on how late the studio session ran the night before. Uh, no, I'm lying. Every day I wake around 10 to 10.30, 11, 12, 1 at the very latest. Taking that semester off from school gave me a new appreciation for rest and Sabbath and sloth in my life. I guess I think that I could afford to wake up late. So every day I jump into my new SUV, drive about 15 miles northwest into the valley, the deep valley where summers are extra hot and winters are a tad bit cooler, where mothers with infants gather on the first Monday of every month to get priority on food boxes, where the cops are constantly on patrol but frustrated in their own right. Because since a recent cold December night when one of their own got gunned down by the hands of two minors, they know that in these kids' lives, they don't make much of a difference. So I guess that's where I come in, right? Check it out. I get paid to hang with kids at an after-school program. And after two years on a job, I've realized that no man really understands what it's like to walk in some of these kids' shoes. Because the way their neighborhood is portrayed on the local news gives them a sense of pride and shame at the same time. They're tired of being fed the same lies. They told me we want to be gangsters when we grow up. Because here it doesn't matter if you're in the house before it's dark because most of these shootings happen in broad daylight on busy cross streets. So they got beef. Shooting each other over colors yet they colorblind. They got beef. Babies having babies. Grandmothers in their early 30s. These dudes go to juvie, graduate, get their GEDs early and have nothing constructive to do but hang on the block and slang on the block and bang on the block. I'm like, geez, don't you guys get bored? Look, in my days, dudes would get jumped in to be down. Nowadays, if you're not rocking colors by the age of 13, weekly by your older cousins, you're getting jumped out. In my days, dudes would fight. Maybe pick up an inanimate object to get an extra boost, but for the most part, they would fight. See, nowadays, these kids just shoot. And the girls think that having a baby by the age of 16 makes them look cute. How did these innocent children stray so far from the truth? But I love them and don't judge them. Look them in their eyes, you'd be surprised. Some of the most thugged out gangsters are the most polite and respectful kids you'll ever meet in your life. But their daddies then ran out and mommies are cracked out and older siblings are in jail. They just want a way out, but they don't know how. Some call me a program leader or a after school professional. To some of these kids, I'm like a mentor or a big brother, and that's all fine, but y'all know what I really wanna be when I grow up? I wanna be an optometrist. I wanna be an eye doctor. I wanna try out different lenses, heal the narrow sighted, heal their vision. And I know I don't have all the answers, and I know it's not an overnight process, but if I could impact the sight of one of these kids' eyes, it would all be worth it. And I don't want any prestige or any plaques or any glory or anything like that. I just wanna know that when I wake up from the bliss of my deep midday sleep, that I've made a difference. Yes, yes. Yes. Let's give it up for the young people taking over this church. Wow. Well, welcome everybody to the Rock Church and the Youth Take Over. It's going to be a great, great day. We have our Pastor Miles is spending time with family today. His daughter Kimmy got married yesterday, so let's thank the Lord for that. I know he's excited. We're thrilled to be here. My name is Marcus. I get the chance to share God's word here today. Super excited about it. I'm super excited about summertime right around the corner. Right? But summertimes nowadays aren't what summertimes used to be, right? Like summertimes, I still got to go to work, right? <laughs> but the young people, you guys get summertimes off, right? This is great, great time of the year. You have beach plans, you've got vacation plans, Disneyland plans. Your yearbooks will be coming in pretty soon. You guys remember yearbooks? I remember used to get my yearbook, and the first thing you do when you get your yearbook, you open it up, you see how many times you were in it. And we're like, oh, I got, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, good. Circle them just so the ladies would know. And then getting them signed was always like, you know, kind of the big deal. 
I don't know about you guys, but I only let females sign my yearbooks. <laughs> only. Only females. And, you know, after you get them signed, you know, the first thing you do when you get them signed, you're like, oh, yeah, she left her number. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a good summer. I didn't have no car. Like, I'm going to pick her up on my bicycle. I couldn't even use the phone, but I had her digits, and that's what counted, guys. And that's what summer times were all about. But I think about this youth takeover, and I think about uh, my, my days in high school. And uh, speaking of uh, youth takeover, hey, Pastor Drew, Trish, can you guys stand up, please, real quick? This is my buddy. Stand up. This is Pastor Drew and his wife Trish. They are now pastors of Aloha Church. Hey, we love you. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for being an example of what we're going to talk about today. Love you, Drew. Love you, Drew. <laughs> Drew. I was the first youth pastor at The Rock 18 years ago until they find a better one, Drew, and then I had to get a different job. And Drew was the second youth pastor. Now today we heard from our third youth pastor in 18 years, uh, Matt Escobar. So it's cool that all, all the three legacies are here as, as well as uh, Pastor Darren as well. But I reflected upon summertime in, 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 in my life as a young man in school. And today we're going to be talking about running the race. You know, the Bible talks about us being in a race. And let me tell you something, guys. Everybody here is in a race. Now, we're at different stages of our race, some at the beginning, some in the middle, and some at the latter part of our race. But make no doubt about it that we are all in a race today. And I remember one race that I was in long ago in 1990. And in 1990 was my senior year of high school. And I was up in Santa Barbara. But I grew up in North Carolina. And I grew up in the inner city schools of North Carolina. And I was fast for the inner city schools of North Carolina. Then when I moved to Santa Barbara, I was extra fast, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Let's just say the surfers were not as fast as my buddies from the inner cities of North Carolina. So by the time I get to Santa Barbara... Right, I think I'm fast. I think I can run. And my senior year of high school, I had a great, great senior year playing football. That was, that was my dream. And, and I, I remember I had this guy that was kind of my, my, my counterpart at the rival school. His name was Napoleon Kaufman. He was a junior and I was a senior. And Napoleon Kaufman went to the school called Lompoc up in central California. And I remembered my senior year, I had a great senior year, I scored 23 rushing touchdowns. 23. My school scored 25. I had 23. You figure what the game plan was, right? So I remember every day, every, every Saturday in the newspaper looking at it and like, Preciado has five touchdowns. And, and, then, and then next week, Napoleon Kaufman, six touchdowns. Oh, man. And then the next week, Preciado 300 yards rushing. And then next week, Napoleon 350 yards rushing. And all through the year, we battled back and forth to kind of who was the main backup in Santa Barbara. So my senior year, it came to racing on, in a track meet, and it was me against Napoleon Kaufman. I'm like, okay, we're going to settle this once and for all. Or who's the real guy? You know, and up to that point, we're about five weeks into the track period, and I'm undefeated. I'm undefeated. I'm blowing people away. And I'm thinking, you know what? I am fast. I am going to win this race. And he lines up next to me. He's just a junior. I'm a senior, right? And then we go, and, they, and, the, and the gun goes off. It goes, and I start running, man. It was great. I could feel the wind in my hair, and about three steps into it, I take a look, and I realize something. I realized there was no way in ever in my life I could beat this guy. <laughs> I'm three steps into it and he's five steps ahead. Like, where did you get those extra steps? <laughs> and this guy, we came, we came to the finish line and he beat me so bad. I never wanted to run a race again. It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And I realized that day, I'm not fast. Just the 99% of the people fast that I'm fasting, they're just all slow. <laughs> he was a junior. He ended up winning state at the 100, and he won state at the 200. And he became also the running back for Washington University. He went on to have a great professional career for the uh, Oakland Raiders. And in the highlight of his career, he left to go pastor a thriving church right now in Northern California. That's what Napoleon Coffin's doing. <laughs> 
I, I like that, yeah. Let's give it up. The pastor got whooped up on the track in 19. Yeah, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that he's not as fast as he thought he was. Thank the Lord that you humbled him. Thank the Lord. Hey, uh, Mason, Kayla, can you stand up for me? This is my, da my daughters. I just want to say thank you, girls, that I love you. You did an amazing job. Tracy, can you stand up, please? I just want to see people that I have a beautiful wife. That's it. Just look. Look at her. Guys, that's enough. Ladies, you can keep looking. Guys, look at your own wife. That's nice. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about winning the race. And the only way you can win this race that we're on, the only way you're going to win it, right, is through perseverance. Everybody say perseverance. Perseverance. Today we're going to talk about the power of perseverance. Because in this race that we're, we're going to run, 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 there's no way we can win it if we don't have to persevere. Right? And you got to understand, during this race as well, that we are all running, that we have an enemy. That we have somebody that's actively trying to keep us from being successful. If you guys can join me, we're going to take a look right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm going to read verses 24 through 27. I'll give you a moment to get there. We'll also have it on the screen. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27. And this is going to frame our message today. It says this. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Can I hear amen? amen. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it a slave so that I, after I have preached to others... I myself will not be disqualified from the race. Here's the deal, guys. We are all running a race. But unlike the prizes that we get nowadays, unlike the prizes that you received in, in Little League baseball, in Pop Warner football, in cheerleading, where are those prizes I ask you today? Where are those prizes that you won that you were so excited about? You know where mine are? I don't know. They're broken, they're dusty, and they're donated. But us as Christians, we run for a prize that never fades away. We run for a crown of glory. We run for salvation. And if we're going to try hard for an earthly prize, how much more should we try for a prize that never fades away, which is the glory of God? It's all going to fade away. Even the, the, the NBA uh, championships that are going on right now, the four teams, it is so important to them right now. Right? It's so important to us as we're watching. But one day, the MVP trophies, one day, those, those, those trophies are going to fade away. And, you know, in this big argument right now, who's the greatest, who's the greatest player right now, who's the greatest of all time. Let me see. How many LeBron is the greatest do we have in the house today? Yeah. How many is Jordan the greatest in the house today? I'm just saying, I thank the Lord that I'm in a church full of wise and discerning people. <laughs> Notice I ain't wearing any bronze to preach today. I'm wearing my Jordans because this is a serious message. And I may have to dunk on some fools while I'm up here. So the, pr the prize, the prize that, th that they're going to get fades away. Fades away. Those championships fade away. But you guys, the race that we're running, the prize that we're running is not only set aside for one person. It's set aside for everybody that endures the race and everybody in this church that receives Jesus Christ as their Savior and lives their life for him is guaranteed that prize of eternal life. What a blessing. And that's what we have waiting for us. But during this race, right, the enemy, our enemy wants to defeat us. And he wants to take away our victory. And he wants to nullify us. And he wants us to quit. And that's why today we're going to talk about the power of perseverance. Because without that perseverance to finish the race, your, your, your ability is going to be nullified. 
It's going to be, you're going to be disqualified. You're, you're, you're going to be canceled out as your ability to bless others and serve the Lord. And you know what? That's exactly what the enemy wants. But today we're going to talk about how to overcome that with perseverance. And we're going to take a look at three reasons why we should persevere. Three benefits today, three simple benefits of persevering today. We're going to take a look at that. And we're going to be taking a look at that out of a message in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, it talks about Paul and Silas. Now, in order for us to be able to persevere, in order for us to be able to have victory, we need a couple things to persevere. Everybody say God. Everybody say God. Let me say others. Everybody say God. Everybody say others. That's what we need because we can't do it alone. And if you try to do this life alone, you're going to fail. Can I hear amen? And the enemy wants to isolate you and make you feel like you're the only one and make you feel like you're not loved and make you feel separate, apart from all of people and God's love. But God, he wants to let you know. I want to let you know today that God loves you and you're not alone. And you need God in your life. And you also need others. Because much of the way that God moves in your life is through others. And I'm going to ask a rhetorical question right now. For all the people 30 years and older. All the people 30 years and older. Who are you pouring your life into? How are you making a difference in the next generation? Are you pouring your life into your career only? Are you pouring your life into your significant other relationship? Are you pouring your life into your brand? Are you pouring your life into what you want to accomplish? None of those things are bad on themselves, but let me ask you this. Who are you pouring into? And if there's not a name popping up right now, I want you to change that. I want you to today find somebody that you can encourage, pour your life into, and help disciple and help mentor because you've got a lot to give this next generation. You've got a lot of failures. You've got a lot of history. You've got a lot of pain. You've got a lot of victory that the young people are longing for and they want to hear from you. Can I hear amen, young people? Young people, here's my question to you. By the way, you guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you for representing today. I like my Harley Davidson t-shirt, except I only got a Schwinn, so I need to set my game up. But my question to young people, who are you actively pursuing in your life to mentor you? Who's discipling you? Who's pouring into you? Or are you just hanging out with your group of friends, with your age group to validate the things that you do, the things that you want to do? Or are you learning from people with more history, with more failure, more more victories? But today we want to talk about Paul and Silas. And Paul was this example perfectly. Paul was a great man of God, right? But he would pour his life into other people. And that's why his ministry continued on year after year after year after century after millennial because he poured his life into people that poured their life into people that poured their life into people. And Paul poured his life into a guy named Silas that we're going to take a look at today. Before I talk a little bit more about Paul, let me just kind of explain who he was in case we want to need a recap. Paul was this guy named Saul. Everybody say Saul. Saul was this guy, he was the Jew of Jews, he said. Like, he knew God's word, he knew God's rules, and he loved God so much, or he thought, that he hated Christians. So much that he would persecute and he would martyr Christians. And one day, as he was on his way to do that, Jesus Christ came to him and revealed himself to him. He fell off of his horse and he was blinded. And Jesus asked him, hey, Saul, what's up, man? What are you doing? And Saul's like, hey, man, I didn't know you. And Jesus' like, I'm the one. It's me. It's me, the one that you are persecuting. So Saul had a revelation from God and then changed his name to Paul. Through he becoming Paul, he then went on, isolated himself, learned, then got people to pour into him. And then he, was now, he now became Paul. Now Paul became an amazing minister of God. And what Paul would do... He would go around and encourage churches and start churches. So this is basically how church started, right? Early Christendom, Paul would go around and he would encourage churches, visit churches and write letters to churches. As a matter of fact, as you read the Bible and you read the New Testament and you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you read Romans, you read Ephesians, you read Philippians. Are you guys with me? You read Thessalonians. Those are books of the Bible. Yes, they are. 
But this is what they started off. They started off inspired by the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit speaking to Paul. And Paul would simply write letters, write letters to these churches. Romans, he wrote a letter to the church in Rome. Thessalonians, he wrote a letter to the church in Thessalonica. All these books of the Bible, 13 of them, Paul wrote, they simply were letters that he wrote to these different churches. So part of that and that mission was a guy named Silas that he went with. And we're going to take a look in Acts 16 today as we're going to draw our message from the power of perseverance. And we're going to take a look at three reasons why we should persevere. He was on a mission. As a matter of fact, let's pick it up right now. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. says this, once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. So here's the deal. Paul and Silas are going to the house of prayer. They were on the way to serve the Lord. They were on the way to glorify God. And while they were doing that, who did they meet? But a slave girl that was demon possessed, that was there to stop their plans. Here, let me tell you guys something. If you've decided to live your life for the Lord, if you decided to serve the Lord, let me tell you something. You better believe that you've got an enemy that's trying to stop you. Have you ever witnessed that? You've ever experienced that, guys? Right? When you're on your way, right, to do something great for the Lord, right? And then next thing you know, you get a demon coming at you. You're on your way to the house of God. Next thing you know, some great argument between you and your spouse. Right? You're on your way to go to, 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 uh, 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 to, to church or to a Bible study or something or to serve somebody. But the enemy wants to stop you guys. But let me tell you guys, greater is he that is in you that is in the he that is in the world. So we don't need to trip when the demons come. We don't need to trip when Satan comes because God is the ultimate power. And so this girl that was on them and that was bugging them day and night for days, the Bible says, and the the girl was mocking them. Finally, they got tired of her and they looked at her, they rebuked her in the name of Jesus and they cast that demon out of that girl and showed the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here they are on their way to prayer. They're getting harassed by the enemy. They perform a miracle through the power of God. Wow, isn't this wonderful? This is fantastic. Let me tell you what happened. The owner of that slave girl got upset with them. He took, this, he took it to the magistrates, to the authority, and then they arrested Paul and Silas for disturbance of the peace. Isn't that crazy? For disturbing the peace. So what happens is they go to jail. But before they go to jail... They were stripped. Everybody say stripped. And they were beaten. Wow. They were stripped and they were beaten and they were thrown in jail. Here's our first point for today of why we should persevere. If you're taking notes, simply write, it humbles us. Everybody say humbles us. Everybody say humbles us. Listen, listen, God wants us humble. Because when we understand that we can't make it without God, who do we have to rely on? But when we think we're the man or we're the woman, we rely on ourselves. But God wants us humble. And the Bible says this, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I'll tell you what, I do not want to be resisted by God. I want grace in my life. I want grace in my relationships. I want grace in my family. I want grace in my finances. I don't want to be resisted by God. So it humbles us. And so here they are in jail. Here they are severely flogged. Here they are stripped. What a humbling place to be and what a bad day. You know how they reacted to this? I don't know how you would react. But what Paul and Silas did, as they were chained up, naked, and beaten, when a clock struck 12, they worshiped the Lord. 
They sang psalms and praises to the name of God. And you know what happened when they started worshiping the Lord? You know what happened when they started praising God? There was an earthquake. That gel shook. And you know what happened when that gel shook? All the shackles that were on them fell off of them through the power of worship. I don't know what your attitude is when you're having tough times, but God wants us to persevere. It would have been so easy for them to give up right there, but they were humbled and they trusted God. And I wouldn't have reacted like that. I don't know. When you get pulled over, right, when it's like, woo, woo, I'm like, I'm not like, uh, Lord, I lift your name on high. I'm like, y'all going to make me lose my mind up in here. Y'all going to make me act a fool up in here. There's a whole different song I'm singing. I got pulled over one time for doing a U-turn illegally. I was busted, right? And I'm in a minivan, though, with, with that woman and my four cute little half-breeds in the minivan coming from church. And I get pulled over and the cop looks at me and goes, are you currently or have you ever been in a gang? I'm like, what kind of gang rolls in a minivan with a white girl and four half-breeds? Like, Come on, dude. Really? This is a I'm driving a Honda Odyssey, cop. <laughs> Sorry. Side note, side note. But how do we respond when we're in difficult times? They worship the Lord. They sang praises to the Lord. You know what happened, too? As the shackles came off, let's pick up the story. It's fantastic as we move into the, the second point here. In verse 22, it tells us they were stripped and flogged. And let's take it now to verse 30. 29, it says this. The jailer called for lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. 30. Then he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He was going to commit suicide, the Bible tells us, because he knew what was going to happen when all the prisoners were set free. And as he was going to kill himself, Paul and Silas stopped him, and they said, don't do that. And he looked at them, and he knew it was their God that did this. And he looked at them, and he asked them, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in Jesus, and you'll be saved. Here's point number two. The power of perseverance. First, it humbles us. Number two, it helps others. Everybody say helps others. others. Look, as we're going through trials, people are watching. As we're going through difficult time, people are paying attention to how you respond. But even though you're in trials, they're also going to see who sets you free. They're not not only watching your tribulation, they're watching your victories as well. And if you give glory to the Lord, there's going to be people in your life that come to you, family members that come to you, kids that you're teaching to come to you, people you work with that come to you. And they're going to watch you and go, what must I do to be saved? Because I want what you have and I ain't got it. And what you got is Jesus. So, point number two, it helps others. Could you imagine if they would have given up right there? Could you imagine if they would have had a horrible attitude? Could you imagine if they said, this is enough. We were praising you, Lord. We were worshiping you, Lord. We were going to pray. We cast out demons. And now we're butt naked in this cell, complaining, beaten. It's not worth it. But they didn't do that. They praised the name of the Lord. Paul had much reason to give up. It tells us in God's word that Paul experienced being flogged. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked and left for dead. He went through hunger and through thirst. He experienced times of being cold and naked. He was imprisoned. But yet he did not give up. If we quit and we give up, we nullify God's ability to use us to change others. And there's a whole world that's watching you guys. There's a whole world that's paying attention to you. And the enemy wants you to quit and he wants you to give up. But here we see Paul and Silas, two people that are pouring into each other's lives. A guy that's mentoring somebody, somebody that, a protege that's being mentored, them serving the Lord back and forth. 
and using each other to glorify him. So the story continues that he asks how he can be saved and they tell him and he's saved. But a couple verses later, we see that it doesn't stop there. He ends up taking Paul and Silas home. And it tells us that the jailer and all of his family were saved as well. Wow. Not only were they saved, but they were immediately baptized as well. Last point is that it honors God. Everybody say honors God. What's the first point? What's the first point of the power, power of perseverance? What's, what's the first point? Humbles us, right? Number two is what? Helps others, right? Number three, what is it? Honors God. God was constantly glorified through the life of Paul and Silas. God wants to be constantly glorified in your life. He wants your life to honor him. He wants your life, young people, to shine for him. And young people, let me tell you something. We have a great and wonderful God. We have a God that can break you out of jail. Amen. We have a God that can take you from your shackles. We have a God that can do that. We have a God that can heal you from your sins, heal you from your pain. We have a God that can free you from your addictions. We have a God that can take away your scars and your pains. He's amazing and he loves you. But let me tell you something else. Our God is so big that he can also ever keep you from having those addictions. Woo. Right, we celebrate the addictions a lot after God heals them, right. But what about the testimony, what about the testimony as I was never on drugs. What about the testimony is that I didn't get pregnant until I was married. What about the testimony that my husband loves me. What about the husband that my four kids love the Lord. God wants that for you guys. God wants this because he loves us. And in closing up right here, I'm going to show a video that, that, that shares this message in a nutshell. But it was the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. I don't know if you guys ever saw this. But it was a gentleman by the name of Derek Redman who was running the 400 meters for Britain. And he had trained all his life for this moment. For this very moment, and he was one of the leading people to win this gold medal during this race. But he had to show some perseverance to finish it off. Let's take a look at this video. I love that video as that young man was training and he, he came to a point where his plan didn't go his way. His hamstring snapped and, and he needed to reach down deep to finish. But you know what? He couldn't do it on his own. And his father came out and we saw that. And he put his arm around him and he helped him cross the finish line. You guys, life is tough sometimes. Can I hear amen? Right? And God doesn't want us to do it alone. And the enemy wants you to think that you need to be alone to do it and isolate you. And that's a lie of the devil. And I'll tell you what, the last part of last year was very difficult for me. 
I have four kids, and, and three of them went through some significant, significant difficulty, including my wife and I. She lost her main client. She's an accountant. She lost her main client, and so financially for months, we didn't know how we were going to make it, and that was tough. Then we find out the news that my, my daughter, Macy, Macy, can you stand up? That's Macy right there. She came up with a concussion, a severe concussion. And then Kayla, can you stand up right there? And she blew out her knee and tore her ligament and all the cartilage in her knee. And my son, who's helping right now on the online campus, thanks for serving, Diego. He serves online. He broke his ankle at the latter part of last season. And it was a struggle as a father to see my kids go through that pain. And I had to help them. And my wife had to, we had to help them get through that finish line. But the enemy wants us to give up. But I tell you what. My daughter Kayla right now, that little girl is starting to jog for the first time. And she's going to come back faster and stronger than ever. My daughter Macy right there, in free time, she was able to practice music more during that time. And she came that faster and stronger. And now she only has a headache when she has to clean her room. <laughs> and, and my son Diego... Uh, uh, um, who, who's in a junior year right now, who broke his ankle, and I shed tears when I saw them take off that cast for the first time, and I saw his ankle go this way and shift this way with his dreams of being an athlete, and I just had to walk away and hold back my tears because I didn't want my son to see my face, the face of his daddy, when I saw his disfigured ankle. But for the glory of God, let me tell you this, he's 100% healed. And for God's glory, his dreams, his dreams of playing in college, let me tell you what, for God's glory, because God is good, he is being recruited by Harvard, by Princeton, by Cornell, by Stanford. And he just got his first Division I offer to play at Davidson where Seth Curry played for football. God is good. The enemy wants us to give up, guys. Don't give up. This verse in Genesis 6, 9 says this, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Drew, Trish, don't give up. Stay strong. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. And I'll close with these wonderful words by Martin Luther King, Jr. He says this, if you can't fly, then run. And if you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Amen. Don't let the enemy lie to you. And we're going to close up in a different way. We're going to close up in a different way today. I'm going to ask all those who are 30 and younger to stand up, please. And don't lie. If you're 32, you ain't standing up. Too bad. Wow. Wow. We're going to pray a prayer over you, a prayer of blessing, but this is how we're going to do it. We're going to put this message into action. And if you're over 30, I want you to stand up. Now's your chance. You and all your wrinkles, get up. <laughs> and those who are under 30, lift up your hand, please. Lift up your hand. You're going to now, over 30, put your hand towards them. And if you're close to them, put your hand on their shoulder. We're going to take a couple minutes to bless them and to pray for them. And you are going to pour into him during this time in Jesus' name as we close out.
If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, Dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know, and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.